Shalom, welcome back. This is going to be the second part of our series of the poor and how is it that we are to be towards the poor. And here we're going to be studying in Devarim and we're going to be going through um, basically um, Tet Vav, which is uh, chapter 15 and starting at verse Zion, which is 7. It may be different in English Bibles. But we're going to be focusing on the important parts of what it is and how we're to treat the poor. Because we learned the first part, we're not to judge. That's what Mashiach Yosho teaches us, not to judge. We're to put a, ourselves in their position. And we're to ask ourselves, how would we want to be treated if I was stuck in the position where I was unfortunate in this circumstance to have the finances or the ability to take care of something? And we're going to hear from the Torah exactly the manner. And, and, and this is the most important of the mitzvahs because this is loving your neighbor as yourself. And when a person ignores this issue of loving your neighbor as yourself, you are inciting violence in the world. You see, it's not our obligation to take money out of our pocket every single time we see a poor person, every single moment we run into a poor person. But it is our obligation to give to every single poor person who asks for help. And if you really look at the issues that are given in scriptures, we find, and I know this for my own self, it's not often that a poor person comes to you specifically asking for help. And why is the poor person asking you for help? Is this is a test to see where your heart really is. Are you more focused upon your financial desire? Or do you care about your brother as yourself? Do you care about your fellow as yourself? In this passage, as we read, it says, Ki becha evyon. And it will be that when there should be among you a destitute person. The word evion comes from the Hebrew word ava, which means to be willing and to be submissive. And why is it the Torah calls him a evion? It's because this man is in such a state of destitute that he is willing to do anything to receive help. You see, it's forbidden for us to take advantage of a person who's in a state of absolute destitute help. He needs it. When you sit there and you think, well, you know, I'll make this guy work for it. Put yourself in his position and ask yourself the question, if you were really in that dire strait, how would you feel? Would you feel like this is a great opportunity that this guy's doing for me? Or would you feel like this guy just wants to take advantage of me in my complete helpless state and he just wants to see me do things? Because the Torah tells us as we see here, Mechad Achicha from your brothers. We first have to start to look that the first place of what we're supposed to be seeking to help people is among our brethren. Be'chad Sherecha, and in one of your gates. Be'etzerecha, and in your land. The Torah is giving us, if we look at the parameters, it's telling us the first state that we as individuals are to attack in order to help out is we need to find people who are right with us where we're at, physically. In our land, in our cities, those who we have among us. Which the Lord your God has given to you. Don't firm your heart. And don't shut it, your hand. The reason why God gives us this commandment to not firm your heart and shut your hand is because of the attitude that is in the heart of man. 
Naturally, it is the attitude of unwillingness to want to step out to help people because we are naturally selfish. We're naturally desiring to seek our own benefit and not the benefit of another. Therefore, the commandment is given to us the heart that we are to have and to place upon ourselves. Mechecha from your brother, Ha'avion, the one who is destitute. Ki, patuach tiftach, opening you shall open. This double verb phrase, patuach tiftach, literally means you shall give over and over again et yadecha, your hand, lo to him. If he comes to you once, if he comes to you twice, if he comes to you three times asking for help, the Torah says, give. This is not the heart of man. See, man says in his heart, listen, I helped you once, I helped you twice. I helped, no, 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 I'm not doing this anymore because now you're coming to me because you see me as some form of financial stability. And he has shuts off his heart because he judges, which is what we learned earlier, in the book of Matityahu, when he taught us not to judge. When a man sits there and sees a person in drier straits or in hardships, the first thing man thinks is you're being irresponsible. The second thing he thinks is you're making fool's decisions. And the reason you're caught up in the situation is because you really don't know how to spend your money. The last thing he ever thinks is, you're in trouble and I need to help you. Now, of course, some people might say, well, I can justify the fact of this issue. Their, their family's in the hospital. The daughter needs care and uh, we need to help out this family. This is very expensive. But when a person says, I don't have enough money to pay my electric bill and I don't have enough food to put on my plate right now. People naturally will say, oh, it's because you don't know how to spend your money. You're buying things foolishly. That's what you're doing. And they tend to have this attitude towards the poor to degrade them to the point where they don't have any trust in the poor. Matter of fact, they don't care much about the poor they'll give to an organization who will give to the poor thinking well surely they'll take responsibility of my money and spend it wisely but you see the Torah does not say give to an organization the Torah says what give to him it says you are to open your hand over and over and give to him people don't be foolish Mashiach Yehoshua he gave freely. He even knew that Judas was stealing from his wallet that was used to help give to the poor. Did he complain about it? Did he mutter an issue to bring it to an end or stop? No, matter of fact, he let him do it. Because he knew God would judge Judas for the evil of what Judas did. How much more so are we to be the same? If somebody wants to sit there and try to use and abuse you, well then what are you doing? You're loving as our Father in Heaven loves us. If you say no, then why does God feed the wicked? Did not Mashiach say that rain comes down from Heaven and he feeds and clothes even the wicked who reject his name, who curse his name, who speak evil about his name. Does he not feed them? Are we not to sit here and act as if like somehow we're more righteous than God? Do we think we have that ability? Now you might say to yourself, but wait a second here, I got a question. What, what if the person comes to me and I give to him? I show him that mercy, I compassionately give to him. And I'm noticing there's a trend. He comes more and more to me. As a matter of fact, I can see by a lot of the things that are going on that he does think of me as being this book of freedom. 
What does the Torah say? See, there's wisdom for everything. You have to understand that. See, God says to give freely because our heart is the compassion that we're showing to help someone in need. Now, if you sit there and you have somebody who just doesn't care and they want to come to you all the time, then you know what you do? You use your brain. You say to him, you know what? I've been needing some stuff to be done around my house. Would you mind fixing that back area and stuff and cleaning that area up? I'll pay you $20 for it. If the person begins to see that you're now wanting to help him, but in a way that he does now have to work and he doesn't like the idea of doing the work, he'll leave. You see, a person who truly cares for your help and who sees you as very merciful, he'll do anything, not because he wants to just be this person who's your servant. It's because the person inside of his own heart, he knows, I don't like being in this situation. That's why I said don't take advantage of him. Matter of fact, the first thing I would ever say to people is give to the person. Don't ask him to work for you. If the person says, listen, I appreciate you wanting to give. Can I do something for you? Let him do that. This way, he'll feel the dignity of being able to work. But most people, that's not how they think. Most people, they want you to be put into a position where you work for them so that they can justify giving rather than giving because you're in need and letting God solve the problem if this person's really being wicked. How many people really out there want the free hand of money? And honestly, the answer is not really. It's not many. That's, if you look at the most people in the world, most people work. Less people are poor. So your thinking is illogical to sit there and think, well, he just wants a freebie. You know, the Torah says, open your hand to him. And doesn't just tell you to do it once. This is petoach tiftach. Open over and over and over again to him. Vatev and surely ta'avitenu. As it says, and surely you shall lend him dai mechasoro, the sufficient for his lack. If he wants you to lend him the money because he wants to feel the dignity. Of paying you back. Allow him. I would never sit there and say, I'll give it to you, but you can pay me back. Because I want you to understand, you obviously have never been poor before to understand how difficult it is for a person to pay a person back. It might take him years to do that. And that's always over his head. A person who's struggling it's already hard enough for them in their struggle. Do not use the law unlawfully. The law was given to us to understand how to solve different issues. If a person truly just wants to suck you dry of money, first and foremost, Mashiach didn't care how much Judas stole. He allowed Judas to steal whatever he wanted because he knew God was going to solve the problem. Matter of fact, even Mashiach's last words to Judas was, the poor will always be among you, Judas. Because Judas was not a righteous man. But if we look at what the Torah says, and we learn to see how to be, the first thing, he doesn't say lend, the first thing he says, open your hand and give to him. Give to him. And don't just give to him, but give to him what is sufficient for his lack. You don't give him what you want. 
you give him what he's asking for. What does he need? Well, I may not have the money. So what do you do? You do everything you can to help him. How much do you need? I need $250. I, I can't pay this thing unless I have this money. I don't know what to do. You know, all I have is 150 Let me see if I can find some more help, okay? That's our obligation, is to raise him up. Not his obligation to go around having to suffer, going door to door asking people to help him, as he has to humble himself to such a level that it, it is absolutely demoralizing because he has to ask so many people and most people shut the door on him. This is what causes people to commit crimes. It's because people, instead of looking at the need, they want the person to just stay needy. They want to look at themselves as saying, I'm happy, I'm fine, I'm glad I'm in my home, I'm glad I have my food, but they don't care about the person who actually lacks. And this is forbidden. That's why the Torah tells us to petuach tiftach, to surely open, you shall open. Open repetitively at yadecha, your hand. Lo to him. V'yasheri chasarlo, and you shall give him the thing that he lacks. V'hi shemer lecha, and now we're warned, guard for yourself, pen yichye devar, lest there be a, a matter, im levecha, in your heart, Lest there be a demonic thought inside of your head that is trying to get you to do the opposite of what you should do because the Torah says to do this. That's why he says, Hishmer lacha, guard for yourself. Lest there be a matter, im levecha, with your heart, bli ya'el. What does bli ya'el mean in Hebrew? Bli ya'el can be derived as two words, bli without an ol yoke. In the Torah, this is defined as literally meaning a matter of hasatan. Because bli al means to be without a yoke, be without Torah. Leamor is saying, Karva shana hashava has drawn near as the seventh year. Shanat hashmita, the year of the shmita. Vra'anecha, and your eye is evil, be'echecha, ba'achicha, against your fellow. Ha'avion, the destitute one, velotitano, and you will not give to him. And the Torah tells us that the attitude of what we're supposed to have is the attitude of what? If the Shemitah year is here, the seven years, remember after the Torah tells us every seven years there is supposed to be a release of debt. Which means I, if I did any acquisition during the years that I am doing things, and the Shemitah year pops around, let's say I, I owed a guy a $300, and the Shemitah year pops around, and I did this within like the second year or the third year within the seven years. But I wasn't able to pay him. I didn't have the finances to pay him. What does the Torah say? The Torah says it is God's mercy and grace that he has upon us that he's required that all of us observe the Shemitah year. And that Shemitah year means what? It means that that man who owed that $300 is literally to be forgiven. Why? Because it is God's mercy that he wants us to learn to have. You see, look at the Torah and see for yourself how much does God literally hold upon us with regard to judgment. And if you see from the words of King David, he says in himself that you do not impute upon me the iniquity deserving. Therefore, we have to understand this, that if our heart is to be pure before God, 
then we should have the same attitude of forgiving people of their debts. This is the righteousness that God requires us to have, is to enter into his presence with the attitude of love and mercy towards others. And this is why he says, don't be like the wicked one. Don't be like an evil man who looks at himself saying, oh goodness, the Shemitah year is coming up soon. This guy owes me like a thousand five hundred bucks. This, this stinks. So I'm going to lose that money? No. Listen to what the Torah says here. Because if we have this attitude, the Bible tells us we have an evil eye. That means our heart is wicked. Evil is your eye. Against your fellow. Have you on the poor. And you will not give to him. And he will call upon you. El Adonai. He will call against you unto the Lord. And it should be sin. Why? Because the man is saying, God, this is so hard. I can't pay this guy. He has, I mean, all he wants to do is just lord over me this debt. I don't like this debt. I've never wanted this debt in the beginning. And all I have is this guy who just is want to come up for me. God, please have mercy on me. God says what? He says that he has mercy on us. Listen what he says. He says, Naton titen, giving you shall surely give, which means over and over again, lo to him, velo yira, and that you shall not be evil, levecha, in your heart. Betetecha, when you're giving lo to him, which means make sure your heart is in the right place when you give to him. Do not at all put an evil thought in your heart while begrudging this. Because why? He says, Ki biglal, for because on the behalf hadavar haze of this thing, Yivarech Adonai Elohecha, the Lord will bless you. Bechol Masecha and all of you doing. And all of the sending of your hand. God says in the Torah that if we are so compassionate and so merciful that we're willing to give to people who owe us a lot of money and we're willing to forgive their debt, just like God says in the Torah, on the Shemitah year you shall release your brother from his debt. God will bless us exceedingly. And this is exactly the sad thing, is people don't want to listen to this. Because they care more about money than they care about love and obedience. Yermiao tells us in the scriptures that during his day he said the same thing. He said, release people of their debts. Release people from being bondaged. Let go. And the people did. But then it, afterwards, their hearts turned, an evil thought rose up within them, and they sinned. And they not just sinned, but they sinned so grievously, it angered God to the point where they had to also be taken captive into Babylon. God doesn't want us to live like this. He wants us to understand that his logic supersedes your logic. I cannot, in any way, shape, or form, pretend that I can have higher logic than God. And this is where the wicked always, you see, are in the play. You have wicked people who sit there and they create documents so that you can fill them out, put your personal information here, put your social security here, fill out these forms and then we'll help you. Oh, because we're being responsible. That's what we're being. No, you're not. A responsible person obeys what Hashem says in the Torah and believes that God knows how to judge a man for the wickedness of what he does. If a man's come to take your money because he has no need, will not God see it? But what did you do if you gave to him with a heart of freedom saying, Here, brother, take. Will God not also see that? 
How foolish is a man to say that God doesn't see? How blind is he if he says that he does not hear? This is what called the logic of scripture, which supersedes the logic of human reasoning. When we trust God and believe, he sees everything, and we stop trying to act like we have to be in control. Now, you might sit here and you might say to yourself, but wait a second, that doesn't make sense. Okay, what about, what about these, these, these things where the people come in and, you know, and there's a certain amount of money that's given, and, and how do you solve this issue of the money that's given and this organization, and, and here this organization wants to help people, and people could try abusing the system, and you know, people try tracking these individuals. You have to understand this. The Torah is teaching us that we as a body are supposed to take care of each other. First off, it is our obligation as a body to take care of each one in our own community. If we want to look at these Torah laws as they're given to us literally here in the scriptures, it is the neighborhood's responsibility to help out and protect the neighborhood. That's the Torah. It, it's, it's because people don't want to obey. That's why there is poverty. It's because lawlessness is increasing. That's why people are in need. If I am living in my neighborhood and a neighbor has need and we are not sitting here trying to help out that neighbor, what are we doing? We're letting him stumble and fall and become poor. And we're literally saying, it's your life. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to help you. We're not literally trying to help them when we're supposed to be helping them. That's not what the Torah says. The Torah says our obligation is to help one another. And so this is the reality. The reality is, okay, because we live in such a wicked environment where people don't want to keep the law. We live such a, a, in a, such a violent environment where people don't want to help each other out. What do we do then? Well, you start by looking at the fact that it says here that you give to the people who come to you asking you for help. And you help them. You give what you have to give to help them. And you make sure it's sufficient for his need. And most of the people that are ever going to come up to you, are it's not often. It's not a common thing for people to come knocking on your door and asking you for help. So what are you doing with the tenth of your income that you make every single year, every single month, every single double weeks, or every single week? Well, that money should be going in your Zadaka box where you're putting it aside. And when that one person pops around, you have $300 in that Zadaka box, which is able to help him because that money, I guarantee you, was in that Zadaka box to take care of their need. God brought that person to you in order for you to help him in his need. This is the problem. If the whole world functioned like this, you wouldn't have these problems. But see, that's not how the world wants to function. The world wants to function like as if they have to be controlling over who gets it and how much they get and when they help. They're not thinking straight. They're not. Because when you teach a society to take care of the people, you teach the society to have compassion on one another. And when a society has compassion on one another, you don't have people in that kind of need who are suffering so much that they literally have nothing because the society keeps lifting up the people. It's a sad thing when you can go to Washington, D.C. and you have a president and outside of the president you have people who are homeless living on the street right outside their doors. What does that say about the president? What does that say, really? If a king had people living right outside of his door who were living on the street, does that tell you the king cares about his people? No. That tells you that the king only cares about his palace and his people, and that's it. This is, this is why the society is so messed up. 
you know, if you actually saw the society change that and revert and say, you know what, we need to take care of each other, you would start seeing the compassion return so severely back to the people. You know, I'll never forget talking to a man from Pakistan. And here I am in this wonderful conversation to him about Zadaka. And he says to me this, which is a very true statement. He says, Americans are the worst people ever. If you are in the water and you're sinking, they throw you a rock and they say, sorry. And they throw it to you so that you sink even further. You know, and yet everybody wants to boast of how gracious and merciful and awesome America is. No, America is horrible towards people. If America was such a giving, compassionate people, why is it most people don't even talk to each other on the street? Why is it most people don't even really want to help each other on a day-to-day -day basis in their own neighborhoods? It's not true. People don't talk. People don't care because they've created an uncaring society. And the Torah forbids this. The Torah tells us that we're not to do this. Because this is why crime rises. This is what causes people to act uncompassionately more and more. Because they don't care when others are stuck in a position of hardship. And they train you to think that same way so that you think, I'm not to care either. But yet, what happens when we really help each other out? What happens when we really give to those people in need? We start looking at ourselves as, I need you, and that you're important. That's why the Torah says we're not to let the brother fall. We're not to let him fall. Because if you did this, it's like you spilling his blood. The Torah says, Lo yachdal evyon, the destitute will not cease mecherev ha'aretz from the midst of the land. Alchin, therefore, ani mitzvucha, I'm commanding you, he says, lemor saying, patuach tiftach, to open you shall open et yadecha, your hand, laachicha, to your brother, laaniecha, to your poor, laevyonecha, to your destitute, mearatzecha, in your land. God commands us to do this. This is a required responsibility for us to take care of people in need. This is why you wouldn't have need for shelters and all this other garbage. Because if you took care of people when they were struggling, they wouldn't fall. If you took care of people, and this is a social issue. And the sad thing about it is, is because society doesn't care. They wonder why God's you know, going to judge. They wonder why there's tornadoes. They wonder why there's hurricanes. They wonder why there's flash floods. They wonder why these things happen. It's because people are not obeying. And they're suffering the judgments of what God's angry at. Because people refuse to walk in obedience. That's why the Torah tells us that we have to give to those who are in need. Not judge them. Not place your attitude of what you think he is and what you think he's done or where he is and why he got there. He says, be merciful. If you were in that position, would you want somebody to be merciful to you? And you know what? If you really believe in keeping God's commandments and following him, God will make you homeless so that you can learn to love those who are homeless. If you really love God and his commandments, God will make you poor so you can learn to love those who are poor. Only those people who have never been poor are never following God, I guarantee you. Because the most righteous man we find in the Brit Chadashah, who was rich, he gave half of what he had to the poor. 
You tell me what rich man today would give half of his own income to the poor and live off of the other half. That's exactly what Zacchaeus did. And that's exactly why Mishiach said to Zacchaeus that truly he had come to see a child of Abraham. Because that's what Zacchaeus was. Zacchaeus was such a tzaddik. He took all the money he had, divided into two. This half goes to the poor, and this half he lived off of. And he was judged, because people didn't know how he really lived his life. I wish I had that kind of money, where I could take half of my income and live off of it, and the other half go to the poor. What an amazing feeling it is, because you know what? Every time we give to somebody in need, we're giving what God says is a lend. We're lending, because God says whatever you give, he's going to give back. It doesn't mean he's going to give you a car, he's going to give you a house, he's going to give you all this amazing stuff. It means that he's going to give you the things you have need of. He's going to provide for your need. You had mercy on him, God had mercy on us. You have compassion on him. God says he'll have compassion on us. You know, Mashiach, his most famous words, if we listen closely, he says, birds have nests and foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has nowhere to place his head. If you have never known that Mashiach was homeless, I suggest you think again if you are not worthy of being homeless too. Because he was. And he teaches us, if you love him, You'll be like him. You'll suffer like him. You'll love the way he loves. You'll see things the way he sees things. Mashiach, he was the poorest person. And he never, ever complained. He taught us through the scriptures that we are not worthless because of lacking money. We are not insignificant because we do not have abundance. He taught us our attitude and obedience to God is how God judges us. He doesn't care how poor you are. He doesn't care how much money you lack. And he sees a person who obeys God who is poor is more righteous than a man who has money and does nothing. We need to seriously take our heart and really change it so that we're being obedient. Especially in the society we live in today where the economy is the only thing people care about and not the caring of other people. When we change our attitude and we change our heart and we sit there and we say we need to be obedient, we need to give those in need and don't care. The minute you stop caring about your bills and your money in your pocket and you start caring about just helping people, you're not going to be afraid if somebody takes advantage of you. Because you'll see God sees exactly what's going on. Who is the greater judge, you or God? Use the wisdom God's given us in scriptures. Stop using your human wisdom to control a matter. I'll see you next time.